Yeah, David Dread of Steel Pulse, and I'm saying heal to Lion Voice because it's time that the lion have its voice, have its own story. Says I'm stepping out here. Hear me now. Yeah, the lion's voice. Raw. <laughs> what, yes. what was Kilimanjaro like in those days? Because it I hear was about this, the place. Yeah, I hear about this place. I've it never was, been there. It was the place. That was before my time. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was the place. And they used to do big shows. Okay. You know, Greg Rice had sold out like two nights. Shabarang sold out two nights. Third World sold out like two nights. How many the, people was the capacity about? What are we talking that about? That place... Because they had a hall yeah. behind the club. Yeah. That place, probably legally, <laughs> was to, supposed to hold about, move all the tables and yeah. so forth, which they used to do. Probably hold about seven, eight hundred. Okay. Well, uh, Shabarangs Shabba used to, uh, the two nights he was there, mm -hmm. pull over a thousand. Wow. Jam packed. I used to MC. Well, this was in the eighties. Yeah, and even up to this day, if there's a big show in the DMV, you're most likely going to see Mr. Carr on the stage introducing the act. I am slowly getting out of that. I'm, okay. You know, let's face yes. it, I'm getting a little older now. But pe yes. people still call me mm -hmm. every now and then. I've done Barry's Hammond yes. for 17 years. It's yes. like I'm his personal DJ. Mm -hmm. That's the people first choice. Lion voice, make the lion let them feel nice. Lion voice, give the lion cups we sacrifice. Lion voice, got to show the people them the lion. Well, lion voice. Man, rich man don't care about the poor, but look along the rich man own the poor man land. The poor say him can't take it no more, but look along the poor man working for the rich man. Rich man don't care about the poor, but look along the rich man own the poor man land. The poor say him can't take it no more. One day he started chanting, give me some land, won't get some land. Wanna build my own house, be my own man then Give me some land, wanna get some land I wanna raise some little baby with a pretty black woman Go to Babylon, them want to stop the movement Stop the family, them bring down unemployment Them want the black woman become a single parent No daddy can do both if Babylon no pay your rent We do the Vatican servants start the enslavement Booking them get rich, half of this slave shit Man like Skip, yeah well, Eile Selassie said the first is the Almighty, and this is the Charles Match Kwasi. Well, King Adi is legendary, them guy not even worthy to be your secretary. Well, now pass the torch to them, them would have full up the dance with their friend. Whole dance hall would have full up with men, whole night no song for the girls, them. Now play no games with them, see them on the road, then I flames with them. Greetings in that divine name of His Imperial Majesty, Emperor Haile Selassie the first. Glory and honor in the name of his chosen queen, Empress Wazero Menen. My name is Kwasi Bansu, a.k.a. the Chasmat Kwasi, a.k.a. Ras Kwasi, a.k.a. the Reading Ras. I'm an entertainment attorney, I'm an artist, I'm an author, I'm an actionist. And right now, I'm the host of The Lion's Voice. And right now, I would like to say welcome. And you know what time it is. It's time for... 
Lion Talk. So we have here a very special guest. I am here in the DMV and we cannot talk about reggae music in the DMV. We cannot talk about uh, live show performances in the DMV. We cannot talk about a uh, veteran knowledge base coming straight from Jamaica, the voice of Jamaica in the DMV for decades upon decades without talking to this brethren here opened his platform for countless artists in the DMV and internationally he's known throughout the reggae industry. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about none other than Mr. Tony Carr. Please introduce yourself to the people. That was a heck of an <laughs> introduction. <laughs> uh, the lion's what? Lion's voice. Lion's voice. Uh -huh. Oh Lord, that was a hell of a introduction yes sir i'm pleased to be with you and and it's an honor um and this interview is just a microcosm of how this brethren has 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 governed his career in music he got a phone call for my i start a youtube channel need an interview w what time you want to do it i'm free this time no big questions asked he's always ready to serve i want to know where did that kind of attitude come from from someone at your level who you know they, they use the term gatekeepers and sometimes they're very difficult for access to deal with but you have never in my experience taken that approach where does that come from well i have never seen myself as being above anyone in my entire life Some people might not agree, yeah. but I see myself as a humble person. And um, when people ask me to do anything, yeah. if I can't, I say I can't. Or if they're doing something that I, it's not what I believe in, I just simply say I can't. Mm -hmm. But if it's something that has anything to do with the culture, I'm always willing to give a hand. And of course, certain sports like track and field. Track and field. Okay. So t tell me, where were you born? Where did you grow up? What was, it, what was your upbringing like? Well, I was born in Shudley, Manchester. Okay. Uh, for those of you who do not know Shudley, if you're Driving from Shooters Hill going towards Christiana, mm -hmm. you pass through shortly. Okay. You actually pass through the, the my first uh, home where I grew up until I was nine years old. Okay. My parents died back to back, two months, 11 days apart. Wow. How old I, were you at that time? I was not quite nine yet. My father died in November. Of 53, my mother died in January of 54. Okay. So, the uncle, my brother, my father's brother, youngest brother, he took. Uh, it's, my, my parents had six of us. Okay. My father had three kids before he was okay. Okay. married, but uh, my parents had six of us okay. three boys, three girls. Okay. Three girls then three boys. Wow. I'm the second to last. And so he took us to Kingston, because that's where he lived. We lived in Franklin Town for a short while. Then I, I moved to uh, Rollington Town area, Homestead Road, okay. to live with my sisters. So I was there for a number of years. My neighbors and our guests, this is where the, the love of music started. Yeah. My neighbors up the road from me was Don Drummond, the great trombonist. Okay, we hear about Don Drummond. Okay. And Alpha Boys, don't you? Yeah, he yeah. went to Alpha. Yeah, he was a great, great trombonist. Yeah, yeah. And then Tommy McCook, okay. 
lived across the Mountain View area, not far from in a straight line, probably okay. less than a mile or about a mile. And for our non-Jamaican listeners, is this uh, Jamaican inner city you're talking about? No. Not at this time. No, no. I never lived in the inner city. Okay. I, like I said, Tommy Mako live across from me. So I, I used to this go is, up to... This is Rollington Town? Where you are now? Yes. Okay. So I used to go up to Don Drummond. Okay. Backyard East, Brewer's Trombone and... I was fascinated by the guy yeah. and it was during this time Jamaica's music started to develop. Okay. In the early days, contrary to what a lot of people like think they like to write about, think they know, yeah, man. Get into ja it. Jamaica, we started to copy. American rhythm and blues, okay. the Smiley Lewis, the Fats Domino, people of that area. And the music was rhythm and blues sounding like. Okay. Because we grew up on American music at that time. Yeah, yeah. In the nights, we used to listen to a station called WINZ okay. out of Miami. We also used to listen to in the nights. Yeah, because the signal could get you. Yeah. yeah, we used to listen to stations in uh, New Orleans. Okay, and that's where the love of American music. Okay. I'm a great collection collector of American music, old American okay. music to this day. And this is why, as Jamaicans, we have to be careful when we talk about people copying our music because we were heavily influenced in those early days by the American genre. Yeah. Some people like to say sure. that our music came out of, uh, of uh, Calypso. Yeah. It was a different thing. Okay. Calypso, Jamaican type Calypso was a little different from the Calypso that was being made in Trinidad. But okay. The same idea. And then he had Mentor, which is the original uh, Jamaican music. Yeah. I'll be frank with you. Yeah. A lot of Jamaicans today have never really heard real Mentor. Okay. You go to the, uh, the airport, uh, I haven't seen it for a little while, mm -hmm. and you would hear, see these guys play. It was a combination of Mentor and Calypso with a little reggae thrown in. Yeah. But what I did, well, we moved to Vineyard Town. Okay. And this is where I spent most of my early childhood. Uh, well, I was a teenager yeah. by this time. Yeah. Yeah. And in that area, I had. One of my neighbors was Boris Gardner. Uh, they, we had a little club. It was a little club in on Dina Road next door to the Globe Theatre called, I think it was a Blue Miss. Uh, and at this time, Vineyard Town is not considered in a city either. No, sir. Yeah, these were like little As a matter of fact, this Vineyard Town at that time was considered Opa. up uptown okay okay wow and we lived in vineyard town for many many years where did you go to high school i went to a high school in a town called balaclava okay <coughs> the name of the high school is st gabriel's high school i understand no why my high school yeah. we're st gabriel's school. Why my high school? It is a Roman Catholic school, okay. which I found out later, no longer wrong. Okay. I found that out when I was trying to get some paperwork, couldn't find it, wow. and then I found out that school is no longer. So that's where I went to high school. I thought you were going to say KC. No. Based on the location. No, no, no. Okay. 
this was in the country where parents sent us there and yeah, so okay, forth. Okay, okay. All right, so I was around at this little club I'm telling you about. They used to have uh, a lot of artists passing through. Uh, B.B. Seaton and his group, uh, Roy Richards, Bl Blind uh, uh, Organist, uh, Mouth Organist, yeah. and a whole bunch of them they used to come through. I think it was like a Wednesday evening. And they would just be jamming, practicing music, so forth. And my love of music, I think, started there. And then, the, of course, the scatterlights now were becoming a big sensation because uh, uh, they started making this music what was now called ska. Yeah. We have moved away uh, yes. from the rhythm and blues mm -hmm. sounding. So how long was Mento around? Because Mento has been so. around for years. But, 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 how long still was around. Mento on top though? When Mento it was, was I, I, I don't know. Maybe in, in my father's time. Yes, yes. Mento is the indigenous music of Jamaica. Okay. Now what I used to do in the 60s. Yes. On, I never. I, I, before I left Jamaica. I left Jamaica in 69. I spent one independence weekend in Kingston, which was the first one, 1962. I was at the stadium when they were learning the Union Jack okay. raising uh, right, Princess Margaret and all them people. It was around. Anyhow, I grew the love of music yeah. because I had met all these other uh, artists and, and, uh, yeah. and the scatterlights now who were the big thing in Jamaica at the time. You didn't know them personally at this time? Well, if I had to say that I knew any of them personally, yeah. it was Jackie Mathieu, okay. the great keyboardist, yes, Don Drummond, yes. and uh, 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 I called his name earlier. So these are like Jamaica legends coming together in a group now to, to form like a super group then. By, yeah. by All of these the musicians way. that started the Scatterlights yes. were were playing in jazz bands. Okay. In Jamaica at that time, they had these big bands, you know, like the Count Basie yes, band yes. type thing. Eric Deans mm -hmm. was the one, Mayfair Tough Old. Again, because they are copying the American music style. Well, jazz. Yeah, jazz. They, were just, yeah. they, they, they played jazz. So yeah. all these musicians were that formed the Scatless were jazz musicians. Yes. Tama McCook had come back from England where he was understand the uh, jazz, well-known jazz man, and he mm -hmm. came back to Jamaica. And the Scatterlights used to play at a big, well-known place in Jamaica. I don't know if it still exists, called Bournemouth Club. Okay. They used to play there and I used to, as a little boy, I used to thief out and go watch them. Yeah. Then I lived across some, what was then, I don't think it's there anymore, the Jamaica Military Band. Okay. And on Saturdays, those a lot of those musicians, are, including the members of the military band, and a lot of those guys also went to the, the military uh, band. And they used to jam all kinds of music. Okay. My love for music, I think, yeah, man, it was so from, uh, from this started exposure. Um, from was, there. So before you left Jamaica, you say you left in 62? 69. Or oh, 69. Before you left, did you have any awareness of Rastafari in Jamaica uh, that was coming up at this time? Yeah. What was your experience well, with Rastafari at this time? When we were growing up, we used to hear all these negative things about Rastafari. But there was an old Rastaman 
who used to come and sit under the street light because he didn't have electric light where he lived he used to come and sit and i got curious why is this man he used to have these two big books another book what is he doing i went and talked to him and he had the king james version bible and the orthodox ethiopian orthodox bible okay. So he was studying both, comparing notes and so forth. Okay. It was then, I think, that I started listening to his stories over a long period of time. Yeah. That and this was in Vineyard Town. Vineyard Town. Yeah. That I came to respect who believe in King Selassie. I. And Rastafari is it? Yeah. I, you know, yes. I grew up in the Anglican Church. Yes, I yes. used to go to church, take up communion and those things. I was, but I respected what I used to hear from this brother. Yeah. And in time, I don't know what happened to him. I don't know if he died. Yeah. He was a elderly man. Yeah. And that's when I realized that what the general or average public was talking about Rastafari or Rastaman or whatever. Uh, it wasn't your lived experience. It wasn't yeah. what was true. See, the first time people started uh, seeing people with dreadlocks yeah. was in... In the early, early mid fifties, I, I, I was still a little boy yeah. when the police raided um, Howell's place, okay, yes, Pinnacle, Pinnacle, yes. and drove them out, and they came to live in Kingston and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. That's when started people started to see Rastas because they were the hair was for lack of a better word, unkempt. Yeah. Well, yeah. Hmm. People feared yeah. them and you used to hear all these negative stories. But mm -hmm. because of this little old man, I realized Rasta is not what they are mm -hmm. uh, preaching and saying uh, all these negative. You're things. seeing an elder going to the street like to read, to yep. get knowledge, to yep. educate himself. And he used to study King James the Version Bible yeah. and the Amoric yeah. Bible. Wow, it, that was the first. So I didn't, yeah. I didn't know there was another Bible. Was another Bible. And, and he, he told me this was yeah. older Bible than the King James, James Version. So he's showing some academic rigor. Yeah. Um, so, I, so, so was what so far in the music at this time? Were there any artists? Was Count Ozzy, for example, or these? Well, Count Ozzy and I yeah. used to go up to his place. Come yeah. all the all the top musicians yes. used to hang out at Renac Lodge, which was from Vineyard Town. Yes. We, in those days, we used to walk. Yes. We didn't have cars okay. like today. What was the name of the place? Renac, uh, 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 it, uh, it's in an area called Renac Lodge, okay. above Rockport. Okay, that was like Warwick Hill area. Uh, Warwick Hill yes. is, is, a, is a mountain. Yes. Uh, that you can't miss when you go to Kingston. Yeah, right. right. Come off the airport. But it was yeah. the lower area of, yeah. if you want to call it Warwick Hill. Okay, but, Rockport. Yeah, but near the, but near the spring. But it was way before you get to the spring. Okay. Maybe two miles or so. Okay. So on Friday nights, they used to be up by count as a, again jamming music. And we little boys used to be outside the fence. <laughs> but they had uh, wooden things around the compound okay. and we peep through and we hear all this music yeah. and again I think that's where love. the love for music you had uh, a front row seat to the uprising of Jamaica's indigenous music I would, I would say that yeah. I would say that now the question was, 
was any Rastafari uh, in the music. In the, in, I wouldn't say Rastafari was in the music per se, but eventually, because during that time, yes. none of the catalyzed, as far as I knew, yes. were Rastafari's. Yes. But later, yes. quite a few of them claimed. Yes. Uh, I think the uh, the bass player mm -hmm. was one of the early ones. Mm -hmm. You uh, remember his name? Uh, I'm trying to remember his name. I should. Shouldn't Drop it in the comments because I know I have scholars, I have people in the industry that watch this channel. Please drop it in the comments um, if you remember the, the name. The name might the, come back to yes. me. Yes. And we have uh, the Lion Pride. I call my subscribers the Lion Pride. We have okay. scholars. So Pride. Big up, yes, big up the Lion Pride. <laughs> but remember, if you subscribe, you're part of the Lion Pride. And we are cultivating an intelligent subscribership on the second biggest search engine on the planet. So we're here talking to a legend in the DMV when it come on to reggae music, when it come on to the industry. We are finding out about the genesis where the love was born and we now found out our own Tony Carr had a front row seat to this music that he plays throughout the DMV for decades. So now talk to us about how did you come to America? When did you come to America? Why did you come to America? I I, came, I was, you know, I, I was a very uh, highly successful high school track coach okay. at Excelsior High School from 63 to 69. Okay. And I'll be honest with you, I came here, one, because I wanted a raise up there. Okay. Didn't get it. Okay. Also, I had met Coming to Penn Relays, yes. I coached a, cha a championships okay. of America, 4x110. One, one, one so from them time, the Penn Relay was going strong. Yeah. Okay. And I, my team won in 67, came okay. second in 68, 69, yeah. came second again. And I'd also coach the one mile, never mind who won at one mile high school one mile in 65. So I'd met this coach from Howard University and he was interested in a couple of our boys, which eventually he got two. And he told me he was moving to this new school in DC and he was wondering if I could help him to get, it, get some uh, people for him to go to school there. I said, sure. So in 69. How old were you at this time as your? I was uh, about coach. 26. So you're a young man. Yeah. Yes. And I came to America July of 69. Okay. Intended to be here just for the summer. Okay. So I came down from New York, I was staying in New York. I, at that time, I had two sisters, no longer living, living in New York. And I was working, I worked at the United Nations for a while, and I worked with my sister's company that she worked at for a while. So I came down to visit the two, two uh, old athletes that I had attending Howard. And- My alma mater, big up the bison as a lion. Okay, go ahead. And the coach said to me, because I always wanted to go to college. And that's what I used to tell my old principal where I used to work. Yeah. I know you can get me to uh, either Mike or Shortwood Teachers College at yeah. the time. Yeah. But he never did. Yeah. So when this gentleman approached me, about doing this. And he said he could get me into school, which was Federal City College, which is now University of DC. Okay. okay. And I said to myself, huh, let me see how this gonna work out. And he got me into school. 
I started, I think, in January, and I brought up about six, eight athletes from Jamaica, including about three or four of guys I used to coach in yeah. high school. Yeah, yeah. Foundation. We're going to talk yeah. to the Emperor Man at some point. Definitely. And Foundation. Duke Rick. Okay. Ricky Hillox, okay. West near Record Mark. Yeah. They were the only two sound systems. Never worked out, and I had the guys this transferred to other schools that were after them from they were in Jamaica. Yeah. Now, at that time, how I got involved with the music at that time, there was no. There was no DJs. Today yeah, there are yes. dozens of them, yeah. per se. But I had, my, you know, I was a collector yes. of music. In Jamaica, I used to, there was an East Indian guy that lived in the area where I was now live, living. And he had, he used, he used to build his own system. Okay. Amplifiers and things like that. And he used to go to Clarendon in the area where a lot of East Indians live. He used to play parties, mm -hmm. but he didn't like to play music. Yeah. So he knew, you know, I was over his house, spent many hours over there watching yeah. him and people yeah. who come to buy his amp or whatever. And so he asked me to come and help him out. And that's the only place I uh, you used to play music in Jamaica. It's just, just to help a friend and of course I had the music yes, yes, yes. and so forth. So when I came here and I started to collect again because I'd given away all my music in Jamaica before I left. We found out at that time, when I came to Washington, the only sound system, uh, sound systems that were around was Emperor yeah. in Washington at that time. I start, I started playing at birthday parties and for all the Howard students, yeah. all of us used to hang out. And that's where I started to DJ okay. and actually started playing at parties and so forth and people start hearing me started uh, hired me <coughs> and now that was just a fun thing for me and i used to get paid and yeah. hey <laughs> money was good in them times uh, as a student yeah. so after that fiasco with federal city college with yeah. the coach didn't work out and I dispersed all the guys and I think on, uh, uh, only about two or three, two stayed back here, one just died recently, yeah, and uh, I stopped running track because I ran track for Jamaica, running the fourth Pan American Games, won a what bronze was medal, what was your event? Uh, uh, I represented Jamaica in the high hurdles, 400 meter hurdles, wow. yeah. and of course the 4 by 400 relay, That's won a bronze joke. medal in Brazil in, 60, in 63. I tried to run a 400 one time and that was it. <laughs> yeah. I used to be 100 meter running. So, Serious. after that fiasco, mm -hmm. I gave up track. Because I used to have this leg that used to give me a lot of, prevented me from I, what I think I could have made the yes. 68 Olympic team. Okay, wow. And I, I gave it up. And then little by little, you know, I started playing at clubs. I was the main uh, DJ at Kilimanjaro for about four years. Okay, at the legendary. Club in, in Washington, D.C. I was the only non-African playing 
okay. at that place for what, years. What was Kilimanjaro like in those days? Because it I hear was about this, the place. Yeah, I hear about this place. I've it never was, been there. It was the place. That was before my time. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was the place. And they used to do big shows. Yeah. You know, Greg Isaac sold out like two nights. Shabarang sold out two nights. Third World sold out like two nights. How many the, people was the capacity about? What are we talking that about? That place, that they had a hall yeah. behind the club. Yeah. That place, probably legally, <laughs> was to, supposed to hold about, to move all the tables and yeah. so forth, which they used to do. Probably hold about seven, eight hundred. Like Shabba Ranks used to, uh, the two nights he was there, pull over a thousand. Wow. Jam pack. I used to MC, well, this was in the 80s. Yeah. And even up to this day, if there's a big show in the DMV, you're most likely going to see Mr. Parr on the stage introducing the act. I am slowly getting out of that. I'm, okay. You know, let's face yeah. it, I'm getting a little older now. But people, yeah. people still call me every now and then. I've done Barry's Hammond yes. for 17 years. It's yes. like I'm his personal DJ. That was uh, the DC World Reggae Fest, Big Up Omar, Pump Station. Yeah. Um, Mr. Carr was there introducing the great Barry Hammond. 17 the, straight years 17 I've been straight into, years. In, here in DC. Yes. I did Dennis Brown about 11 times. I did. I did, I have emceed every major artist except one group, Steve Pulse. Okay. I've never, I've done Peter Tuck. Yeah. I was and supposed to. it's funny you say that because I have a drop from David Hines that I use for yeah. this. I've <laughs> interviewed him about yes. three, four times. Yeah, I'm going to make sure I use that drop from David and Hines for this episode too. He's a good interviewer. Yeah, man. The last time we spoke, he, he was rather gassed that I knew so much about Steel Pulse. I, I, rem, I had to remind him, I was the one who introduced Steel Pulse music on the radio in D.C. Okay. and probably one of the earliest ones in America. Okay. I would yeah. not claim that I was the first in America, yes, but yes. I was one of the earliest. So, so we jumped ahead. How did you get on onto the radio? So you were DJing parties around the DMV. How did you, you transition to, to your iconic radio program? Okay. In 1977. Okay. That's the year I was born, by the way. <laughs> Go ahead. Just to give you some context where we are coming from. In 1977, mm -hmm. I was at a Mighty Diamond show at the University of Maryland. Okay. And I stung up with Bobby Newby and Ricky Hillox. Good friend. Ricky Hillocks on West Indian Record Mile. Okay. And the promoter came out of this stuff and said, Rick, my God, guess what? I don't have an MC. I forget, I do everything, I don't have an MC. Show soon start. And Rick and Bobby said, Tony, go help him out. I said, but I don't know about MC. He said, I'm paying you. I said, okay, let me follow you. <laughs> And I never forgot when I walked out on that stage yeah. and saw this huge hall pack. The only thing I could say is, are you ready? <laughs> the mighty diamonds. And I walked off the stage. <laughs> and people went crazy. That simple introduction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Short and sweet. That's how I got to start the MC thing. Okay. So I was getting paid now. Yes. So I like that. Of course. Well, how I got into radio. At that time, this was two years later, 1979. We had two Caribbean programs on the radio. One at WPFW, which is still there, Von Martin, yes. Caribana. Yes. Legend as well. Yeah. And John Blake, at WHO. Another legend. Uh, Who's celebrating 50 years this year oh, on yeah, HO. Yeah. So these are the legends of the Washington DC area in terms of radio. You cannot come to the city without both of these ones. 
if you're on any level or category. So, we used to hang out a lot at West Indian Rock and Roll. Yes. And in our many conversations, we used to, a lot of artists used to pass through and all that. This was, even, this was before, I think Rush Record, I don't remember if they were around at that time. But Rick used to get upset because he used to send his music to the other two guys. And they didn't play it as much. And they used to play reggae, but yeah. they would play reggae that was popular in Trinidad, okay. which was not necessarily popular in Jamaica. In Jamaica. Oh, for the diaspora, yes. yeah. yeah. So he said, Tony, we need to get our own. We need to get a reggae program on the radio. Your job is to call all the radio stations in Washington. To see if anybody would be interested. Yeah. So for days, I was going looking for these phone numbers call. Nobody was interested. Okay. And then finally, I called WHFS, okay. a station we didn't think would be interested. And when I said I am looking to speak to someone. In the authority uh, manager or somebody with regards to doing a reggae program there uh whole, at least somebody doing a reggae program yeah. and the lady said hold on the next thing I, I i heard was where the hell have you been mm. i've been looking for someone for years it was the owner okay. jake einstein okay. And I was flabbergasted. I said, you're looking for, he said, yes. I used to have somebody here that used to play Calypso and all that, but that was not our cup of tea. What year was this? This was 1979. Okay. So, Rick and Bobby Newby said to go meet him and talk with him. So I went and of course you had to pay I think it was like a hundred dollar an hour. So Rick said he was sponsored and they would try to get other sponsors. Okay, so Rick, who's going to do the program? And they both look at me and say, you. I said, you're crazy. Well, I don't know nothing about radio, man. I don't know anything at all about radio. I knew the, the music, mm -hmm. but I, you know, I don't know what it took to, yeah, to, do a program. to uh, be on the radio. Yeah. I said, man, you can handle that, man. So I went to meet Mr. Einstein and we started the second week, a Sunday afternoon. I think it was like four to five or something around there. With a program that I have come back to call This Is Reggae Music. Yeah, yeah, iconic. And I was there. I'm telling you, it was icy cold in that studio and I was sweating because I was nervous. Yeah. And Mr. Einstein had told me, don't worry, go have somebody there, he will Run guide you along. Yeah. So got there early enough, the guy told me, you know, my signal will always be this and so forth. Don't worry, I'll play two, three songs and then when I do this, you say, who sang those songs and move on. After a while, I got real yeah. comfortable doing it. Yeah. And uh, that program was on for a couple months and Rick gave it up because he said he couldn't get any sponsors okay. to help him with yeah. it, the cost. Yeah. And that was that. In the meantime, I was a volunteer at w, uh, PFW. Yeah. So I got a taste of the radio thing. Mm -hmm. And I used to go and hang out with at, uh, by uh, Von Martin's program. Yeah. 
and I wanted to learn how to run the board, yes. which I did. Then I started pestering the then program director. He was a brother from Africa, as a matter of fact. Forget his name. And couldn't get anything. Finally, he called me one day. So we used to talk about jazz. I used to talk about uh, Monty Alexander. I used to know him as a little boy. And yeah. I, oh, we love jazz in Jamaica and so yeah. forth. And I, I used to go to hang out and out. So he said, you always claim you know jazz. I had a nice jazz collection. And uh, he said, well, I have a time slot starting blah, blah, blah. You think you can handle it? But you, you're, you're going to need a license. In those days, you had to have a license okay. to operate the board. I said, no. So Sidney White, I don't know if you know Sidney White. The Sydney White and I used to live in the same building. Okay. And in talking with him, he said, I have a license. He, because he was on radio up in upstate New York when he was going to the university up there. So I said, oh, I have a guy who have a license. He said, as long as there's somebody with a license in the station, you're good. Well, we started, Sydney and I playing jazz. But my intention was to somehow get some reggae music in there. The reggae, yeah, man. So after a couple months, I said, Sydney, I'm going to start playing reggae from 5 to 7.30. Now, remember, both of us going to work after that program. Yes, yes. So I said, Sydney, you can leave. Just sign the book. And you can go home, go get a little rest. And then I leave and I go to work on my other job. Dead tired. So I started playing reggae 5 to 7.30 without the knowledge of the uh, program director or anybody in this, this management. This is the Jamaica rebel spirit that is coming out now. <laughs> <laughs> and we had the first fundraiser. It might be like what we had a yeah. spring and I was amazed I didn't know if anybody was actually listening yeah. I was amazed how many people called I was making pledge yeah. to the station to the program yeah. and at about seven o'clock in the morning the station manager called me and asked me, uh, Tony, what are you, why are you playing reggae? Nobody wants to hear reggae this time of the morning. I said, well, her name was Lauren Questlove. She just died not too long ago. I said, well, something is wrong because I've raised over $600. And she said, you what? I said, raise over six. I said, anyhow, I can't talk to you now because the phone is ringing. And the phone really was ringing. Because yeah. I was the only one there yeah. taking yeah. the pledges. I know I missed some. About 10 minutes after the program director called me, sleepy. Tony, why are you playing reggae and you didn't tell me and you didn't do this yeah. and that? I said, well, you know, I just was trying to think. But Lauren, tell me your, how much money you say you raised. I said, well, it must be over $700 now. But boss, I can't talk to you now. The phone ringing. And I soon get off the air. We'll talk to you later. So I got over $700. WPFW at that time had never raised a single dollar from 12 midnight to 9 a.m. at any time okay, wow. in its existence. That is a fact. Wow. So you Never is. Really. So when they saw that, yeah. he said to me, I'm going to give you a reggae program. I'm going to give you a time slot. So I think it was either a Monday or Tuesday night he gave me. Like from 11 to 1 or so. It was always late. Yeah. I took it. 
So Sidney White inherited that, that program. That program. He kept it going. Yeah. So there was now two reggae programs. Okay. And at that time, Papa Wabi was around the stage. And Papa Wabi is going to be on this platform. I spoke to my ready, so get ready for Papa Wabi. We're getting all of the, the DC legend at night. Oh, and yeah. uh, we had, by the side, we had a, a program director. His name was Drew Pember. Okay. I think it was his name. And he loved reggae. So between him, Papa Wabi was on the ear, Drew Pemba was on the ear, okay. Dara at one time was on the okay, ear. Okay, and I so have we, to get Mama Dara too. <laughs> we were, we were now f yeah. almost flooded with, with reggae, reggae programs yeah. on WPFW. And all were doing well, doing well raising money for yeah. the station. Yeah. And uh, I was there for about three years, 1982 to 83. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Answer, yeah, and then I got involved with some people. You know, PFW has been having its internal thing for years. Yes, yes. It's going on right now. Okay. I can tell you that. Okay. I stay out of it these yes, days. Yes, yes. But in those, in that time, I thought I was doing the right thing by being involved with these people. Yes. and. Uh, the Washington Post had this big write-up. Wasn't pretty. Yeah. We were I was surprised. Yeah. But what I didn't know that the, some of these people wanted the then general manager out. out. So oh, all yeah. this Internal, negative thing. Yeah. So the general manager said, well, she know she heard what was happening and she knew for the ringleaders. And if any, uh, if if any, uh, we don't bring a letter of apology by twelve o'clock on a said day, we all would be. But there are some people I don't need apology from. They're gone. Yeah. Anyhow, in them days I used to take bus, and when I got to her office, it was five minutes after twelve. <laughs> And I was suspended. Okay. So I left WPFW three years after. And about two weeks after, I got a call from somebody and said, Kathy Hughes is trying to find you. Okay. She owned uh, at that time one station, WOL which was located on, uh, I think it was at Wisconsin Avenue okay. in Georgetown. Okay. And so this I went is, to... This is the multi-millionaire, no, yeah. Kathy Hughes, TV over, One. Yeah, over 150 stations. Yeah. Our so, son is now, I think, is the one who's basically running it. So I, I went to see her, and she said she's been looking for... They had a reggae program at this time. And whatever happened, I heard the, uh, the the guy who was hosting the program either said something or did something against station policy and wanted to fight Mrs. Hughes because she wanted to get rid of him. And so they got rid of him. But she said she, she wanted Reggae, reggae to program. continue. So I went and she said, uh, if I can recommend Caribbean businesses, at that time, there was not a whole lot of Caribbean business. Yeah. There so was she, was, some. she was looking for ad revenue and sponsorship dollars. Yes. Correct. Anyhow, I started at WL and I was there for about close to three years. And she, she called me one day and was said, it a paid position or are you? Yeah, okay. small money, but yes. I was being paid. Okay. Okay. <laughs> because explain, um, public radio, you don't necessarily... No, you, we are volunteers. Yeah, volunteers. And uh, so that was that. I, I used to be on from 6 p.m. to 12 midnight, six hours. Wow. But of course, 
a lot of people couldn't hear WL because it was a thousand watt station and after six it would drop to about 900. Wow. So a lot of people, Caribbean businesses, were scared to, to advertise. advertise on it because yeah. they live out in Maryland and so forth and they, 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 they said they can't hear you know, especially Jamaican people, they want to hear where the money I go. Yeah, man. Anyhow, so after about four and a half years, that program was shut down. Then I started going over to WHOR, John Blake, Caribbean yes. Experience. He yes. used to be on, I think, on Saturdays. Yes. So, you know, help out and so forth. And I used to take my music that I get and go play. And I, after I learned to run the board there at HOR. At Howard University yeah. Radio? Mm -hmm. 96.3 FM. 96.3, people be too. I would play the music. Mm -hmm. See, a lot of people didn't know because my name was not called yes. uh, as the person who... But I used to be the one spinning the music for years on John Blake show. Okay, super team. And he and Bobby Mew, um, Bobby Adams, otherwise known as Bobby's Music Machine, mm -hmm. they, they they were in the back studios putting news and all that stuff together. Okay. And when it was time for commercial, I would go get John. Yeah. He, you know, write down all the songs I play. He would do the commercials back, gone back until at, and usually that was for the first hour yeah. i would be do, doing that playing the music yeah. un, uninterrupted then in 1989 i was the manager of kilimanjaro international records they had started a record store they, they had signed up a couple of uh, African artists. So they used to bring a lot of big time African artists to Washington yes. and New York. Yes. And I got a call from this gentleman who was the, now the program director at WPFW. Yes. And uh, apparently had a, you know, but this time Wabi and Sydney White, they were doing the reggae program at PFW continuously for years. But uh, had a, he, he, he had a little problem with Wabi, which I will not get into. And he said, uh, Every time he, he said, I'm not going to take reggae off the air, but I have to, Wabi has to be off for a little while. Would I come and help out? Can I come see you tomorrow? So he came and he explained the situation. He said, this would be for about three months. So the, the people that Wabi had, made got mad or whatever would cool down and things okay. and I went back and after a couple of weeks I raised over two thousand dollars the first day and they said well you ain't going nowhere I'm not going to say what they said about anybody else. This is not that channel. This no. is your story. You want to but you're about. not going anywhere. Yes. Mm -hmm. And in time, I will bring back Wabi when I have that. Which he did. Yes. Brought back Wabi. So I've been back at WPFW time. since 1989 until now program went through different changes over the years. I had a reggae program, 
I had a Caribbean program. Okay. I also hosted perhaps the most successful Brazilian okay. show on PFW. I had a beautiful, well knowledgeable uh, co host from Salvador Bahia, Anna. He inspired the show? Or? No. The, sh the Brazilian show was there. Okay. Well, you took it over. But uh, somebody left. Yeah. I think the show used to be. You speak uh, Portuguese? No. You speak Spanish? No. Okay. You just. But love, you just love I used to go to Brazil, have the love of the. Okay. Uh, oh. At one time, for about six years, I was the number one Brazilian DJ. <laughs> in town i used to play at all the brazilian okay, functions because okay. i'm a music man, yeah, man. You're, you're, okay you're so we started that program there at pfw we continued that program at pfw with lovely anna okay. and uh, who's now known i think as celia as a, yeah. she's a jazz yeah. does brazilian music around town okay. and then we had that program director had reggae Monday through Friday for two hours each yeah. evening at PFW. Okay. Uh, and and was one, I was one, I don't remember the other people. Wabi, of course, was on Fridays. Uh -huh. I used to be on Thursdays. Wait, used, what year was it? This was this early was, 90s? This, this, this was the early 90s now. Early night early so 90s. There was a large Jamaican population in the city at that time too. So. Was always. Yes, yes. There was always a large Jamaican yeah. population before I came. You'd be surprised how many Jamaicans live here. But there are Jamaicans who you don't see them at Parties. You might see them at Berry Salmon. Yes. <laughs> you might see them at Third World. Yes. But you're not going to see them at Heavy Liquor right. or, or Gather. Certainly ain't going to see them at Dexter Dappen. <laughs> if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, different. They, they, they're young folks today. Yes, yes. So, and, uh, so you, 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 are, you are now the, the, the pinnacle of, of WPFW during this period in terms of reggae music. Will you call this your golden era on the radio? Or what would you classify as your your, your height in terms of <laughs> well, the I don't, of journey? Or are you I'm still not, I'm in not, the hype? I, I am not into that kind of hype. Okay. I was never a hype person. Yes. I never considered myself a radio personality. Okay. How you hear me talking? Right now, that's, that's exactly. how I talk on the radio. Exactly. Well, you have a you have a classical Jamaica broadcast voice, though. You know that. I do, that I don't know. You're telling me that, I'm so that's something that. new. But I have the knowledge mm -hmm. of the music, and I think that's why you resonate because you you provide a home away from home for Jamaicans. So sometimes they want not only music. Jamaicans, yes. they're lovers of reggae lovers music. Lovers of reggae, but yeah. particularly Jamaicans because sometimes you know in Jamaica the radio is a big part of the culture. You would have it playing all through the day and they don't get that in foreign in terms of that Jamaican tonality and how you speak so I think you provide that for a lot of people in the DMV they tune in just to hear that resonance in terms of, of, of your your how you speak because there's a particular way that Jamaicans who grew up in Jamaica educated in Jamaica and came up around the music speak and I think you exemplify that in terms of your delivery well I'm hoping that they didn't tune in to hear me, they tune in to hear the music. Okay. So the program has evolved over the years. At one time they had me from 12 midnight to 2 a.m., which I hated, yes. didn't want to do it, had planned to quit. And uh, uh, Gloria Minot, who was at PFW at the time, she said, don't quit, she's Jamaican. Yes. She said, don't quit because you quit. This is what they're trying to do. Yeah. It, uh, no management. Yeah. They want to get rid of reggae. Okay. And blah, blah, blah. But they can't touch Vaughn. Because Vaughn 
It's the, it's the only original. Uh, never, never come out from that early right. time till now. He's been there from the station started. Wow. So they can't touch him yeah. until he decides he's he wants yeah, to go. Yeah. That's a fact. So uh loyal listenership. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She said, Tony, see, see if you can hang out. So I used to be there from 12 until 2. Get home, I had to go to work. I was dead tired. But I I did that for I don't know, six, eight years, six. I remember this is volunteer work. Yeah. Too, so this is the passion that has sustained reggae music in the diaspora around the country. So they had changes again, program director changes. And the guy looked at me and said, uh, Tony, I know you hate it this time. I have a better hour. Uh, would you want to do Sunday nights 10 to 12? I said, what happened to the Brazilian program? A general manager had hijacked the program, taken it from me. Okay. But he claimed I was not Brazilian. Okay. Now, I, I, I've, I've been to Brazilian about 10 times. Okay. And he, he never went once, but he said, I don't know anything about Brazil. He, he didn't know anything that I was playing at Brazilian parties. Okay. Anyhow, that's his job. He took the program out. So when he told me, that's the time slot I'm going to take. I said, yeah. I wanted to get that bastard off the year. Mm-hmm. I hated him. Mm-hmm. What, what year was this when you started back at 10 o'clock? Which is your current? Oh my God. Slot. You know, I don't look at times yes, and all that. Yes, yes. But it's probably about eight, nine years. Okay. 23 now. Yes. It's about eight, nine years I've been at... 10 to 12. The program director said to me, Tony, I, when I moved to 12 to 2, he had suggested, I don't think people want to hear soca music at that time. I smell a reggae, which is what I provided. I dropped. So when they moved me, I renamed the program again. This is reggae music. Okay. And I have had changes to the program mm-hmm. because back in the back in the good old days when dance hall was really nice. Yeah. I used to kill a lot of dance hall. Yeah. I can't play the 99.9% yeah, of the, trap of the of yeah. whatever. I don't know what is a trap yeah. <laughs> of music. I, I heard about I don't yeah, know yeah, yeah. what it is. Yeah. Anyhow, I decided nobody does this. Let me try it. And this was to really introduce new reggae, new artists. So that's what I started to do. Mm-hmm. Everybody else was playing the old retro hits. Yeah, yeah. You turn on an internet station or mm-hmm. whatever. That's what they were playing. Yeah. I said, I'm going to do something different. Playing the new artists. So I started playing new reggae and introducing new artists. And you're a lifeline to local artists, let me say that. Well, I've always supported local artists. Yeah, yeah. Those who want to keep the connection, yes, yes. there's still one or two, especially since I don't play dance or, yes. you know, that's around. Yes, they yes. don't keep in touch of, mm-hmm. but uh, the Lenny Curlew, the Carl Malcolm, uh, Jaw Works and all that, I play their music. Lady, Lady Flame, yes, Lady doing some Flame. great things now with, yeah, man, yeah, man. with uh, gospel music. Yeah, man. Uh, yeah. and uh, I play their music often and every now and then somebody would give me something local never heard of them play their music i haven't heard of them since that so yeah. you know people do their thing yeah and 
Yeah. 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 I remember playing your music. And what I have found playing new reggae music, playing new artists, I have lost a lot of the young Jamaican audience, which is okay. They do their thing. But I have a loyal set of listeners. And Jamaicans still listen. Yes, yes, yes. A lot of them do. They might pretend they don't, they but don't. they do. And what I've found since I started doing that, yes. that Taras Riley, for example, yes. she's royal. I was the first one who played that damn thing, mm -hmm. probably, probably in America. Yes. And they were not playing that thing in that song up in New York yes. when it was yes. released. Yes. They, were play they started playing it four months after yes. I started playing it. Yes. They were not playing it in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. He told me they started playing it. Uh, almost six, eight months up, wow. April, May. So his first trip up to perform here was at Crossroads. Yes. And I did an interview with him. And he told me they only started playing in Jamaica when they heard it was popular in the Eastern Caribbean. Wow. That's how radio is in Jamaica. Yep. They, they follow a lot. But I find now that a lot of artists Listen to my show. Yeah. You know, I do this for Facebook Live. Yeah. And they pop up on my show, on my Facebook Live from time to time. Uh, and he knows every artist. You can imagine big names, small names. They, if they come to the DMV, they have to go through Tony Carr. I want to ask you because... I, I, I go ahead. don't want to say go through me because no, you, I you, am you, not too, that much humble. into the... Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, I... As a younger generation, I can put you up there. You know, <laughs> okay. You know, because I, I can I am, tell it how it I is. am... <laughs> these days, yes. I'm more in the background. Yes. Yeah. Every now and then, somebody will call me to MC a show. Yes. If... It's the type of artist... Yeah. That's, that... That's on brand for you. You know, I will go. Quality if, music. If not, yes, I'll stay away. Record, yes. um, you know, uh, I have a large Rastafari audience. And um, you you know a brother that is very legendary in the Rastafari community, which is Carl Philpott, Brother Carl. I was... Give us the issue I used how to, you know Brother Carl. Brother Carl yes. went to the same high school where I was coaching. Okay. So I used to teach him... Excelsior. I used to teach him phys ed. Okay, wow. So you know from them time from, then, from yeah. that, I know both him and his wife. Okay, from a Valerie. I yeah. have to get them on this. I platform. love Valerie. Yes, okay. yeah. everybody does. Everybody. <laughs> I love Valerie. That is she's royal exemplified. Yep. And yes, I know I, I, I know Carl from yes. back when he was uh, both he and his wife from they were kids at Excellence High okay. School. And I used to teach Carl uh in Phys Ed. But brother Carl just turned seventy, so is there and i'm 80. okay okay so i was gonna ask so you see this young man here looking young I, and spry i started doing a lot of things when i was young <laughs> <laughs> so we, so we give thanks and then finally i just want to you know because this was a beautiful interview and i know your time is precious but now in terms of uh, i want my my listenership to be able to tap into you I have listeners in Africa. I have, you know, we're over 830 strong right now um, in terms of subscribers. Many more people watch the program. Only actually about 40% um, of my w people who watch the videos are subscribers. So, you know, I can tell by my analytics, you can see who's watching. But how do people get in contact in terms of your, uh, is there an internet link? Just give the people a of way course, to connect. Of course, WPFW has always been on the internet yes. and uh, people can tune in to wpfwfm.org that's o-r-g yeah man. and i'll put it up on the screen as well and about six internet stations okay also carry my show okay one in london okay 
so you've gone global now. Well, I was always global with WPF, WFM. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah, but I have one in London. Mm -hmm. They repeat the program. It comes on early morning there, and okay. the, the guy told me he repeats the program Tuesdays, mm -hmm. nine to eleven. Okay. I have a station. Let me see. In Maryland, there's two. Okay. One here in Washington. One in Florida. And I think it's about six stations that carry, carry the program. Mm -hmm. I also do this Facebook live thing mm -hmm. because I found out there, were, there is a, uh, uh, a small set of people who seem to like that. Yeah, they want to see. see me. Yeah. I don't know why because I, you will not see me jumping around yeah. in the studio. No, no, it's a visual time that we're living in. Though. People you understand? Like to, yeah. yeah. People like to connect with the human. Uh, it, you, I see it on Facebook all the time, people jumping up and down like yes. them crazy. I don't do that. I'm doing radio. And I, well, a, a, a lot of people do things for likes. Yeah. I'm just doing my program and if you want to, uh, tune into Facebook Live and see a boring old man. Just sit down. <laughs> tune in. Far from boring, uh, yeah. riveting and captivating, legendary. These are some of the words that we will use to describe our very own because we have to give flowers to our elders in the business who set the way again. You know, anytime I have anything with Jamaica music content, with anything. I'm there. One call, um, come up, you know, give me a date no asking where you've been because i'm guilty of not keeping in touch you know um but he, you never hear him say nothing like that but i always tell people my superpower is my network and i'm proud and, and, and honored to say that tony carr is part of that network in terms of oh yeah anytime sharing. you have anything i'm there yeah man and, and, and as I, this is a testament so you just call i'm just getting this platform started and Call, you know, he didn't ask me how much subscribers may have or, or what may I do. I'm just aware and when. So I really want to thank you for giving me this time um, and and, I, and learning more about your journey to, to where you are as one of the icons. Um, I'm sure you've got many awards, many things. Oh, yeah. Um, I've gotten over 30 other awards wow. over the years. You see? So, so this is the type of people that we're bringing on the platform. And we're honored because the time has come for the lion to tell our own story. And this is the lion voice. Lion voice. Well, Eile Selassie the first of the Almighty, and this is the Chaz Match Kwasi. Well, King Adi is legendary. Them guy not even worthy to be a secretary. Well, now pass the task to them. Them would have full up the dance with their friend. Whole dance hall would have full up with men. Whole night no song for the girls, them. Now play no games with them. See them on the road, then I flames with them. Poor people buy airplanes with them. Take them Africa, give new names to them. South America will do the same for them. A lot of children, no more pain for them. Black people, no more chains for them. Rastafari, he will reign again. King of these, them a champion. And them no freedom, no one. Since I so love one like them, but we will send him go by hell, go meet Satan. King of these, them a champion. Play for Rastafari, daughters and son. Since I so love one of him, more words sounds like at them like pagan. Here one now go fight with them. Don't care who online a type for them. Don't care who a hype for them. From me stepping at the dance, we frighten them. Don't play it all night for them. Them a hidden so lightning strike for them. Her light it a brighten them. We have to demonstrate the Trinity's might for them. Cocking at these, them a champion. And them no freedom, no one. Some boy love going like them, but we be send him go a hell go meet Satan. King of these, you a champion. Play for Rastafari, daughters and son. Some boy love one of them, but we slaughter them all like pagan. 
So we now waste no time with them Gotta see Africa sunshine again Africa they on me mine again Mount Zion mountain we will climb again But me not share no sign with them I know they'll just act blind again Then I have to remind again That my people are the most high children